This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, still recording today from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today in Bewilderbeasts, we are going to talk about an animal control investigator who gets a delicious, delicious surprise. Emus beat the Australian army, and we finally have a spy. Whew, spy. <laughs> a story about my phobia that we finally have to include in the podcast, so if you hear a thud, it's just me passing out in this closet from fear. Okay, let's go. Today is a long one, so I'm just going to make it short up here at the top. But first, we will have a common phobia warning, the sound effect that I've only used once. And this is going to go in the third segment of today's episode, so if spiders are not your jam, you can totally peace out after the time emus beat an entire army. I have a bit of news up top here, too. My friend and sister from another Mr. Sip Zipperstein is a veterinarian out of Oakland, California. The two of us started another podcast in the animal vein called Totally Possum Pod. The logo is, well, a possum. It's just us two friends who happen to work with animals, so we will talk about harder subject matters in the animal world, like how car safety equipment is tested. Hint, until a couple years ago, it really, really wasn't with horrible outcomes. But the other part is that we also go off the rails as friends do. And we swear quite a bit and we have a good time. It's as if David Attenborough would have to clutch his pearls listening to our silly animal podcast. So we have a good time and we talk about maybe bizarre animal anatomy that we wouldn't really discuss here. And maybe the mating habits of millions of fish that when they do mate by the thousands in a group, It creates such a loud sound that it deafens other wildlife in the area. Yes, there is absolutely other language that in that podcast we would use instead of the dance I just did here. So think of it more as Bewilderbeast After Dark. So for adults or very, very, very latchkey kids, you might absolutely love this show. You will learn a ton about a lot of insider stuff in the animal world, and you will hopefully laugh out loud a lot too. But parents... I am not comfortable sharing this one with my kiddo, and I'm a pretty open person. (laughs) So you do hear what I am comfortable with and I talk about on this show. So grain of salt, have fun. If it's your jam, follow Totally Possum Pod and subscribe, and you will get a new episode every two weeks. And with that, let's go on with this podcast. It's not very often that one of my sources comes from a food blog, but here we are. According to Delish.com, a Polish woman called Animal Control because a strange animal had been sitting in a tree outside her window for two days. Quote, people don't open their windows because they're afraid he is going to enter their house. So what was this mystery animal that had an entire neighborhood in Krakow, Poland on edge? Was it an apex predator? A rabies carrying mammal? A new marsupial species? Everyone is afraid of him. Inspector Adam, because there is no way he's giving his real or last name because this story is just too embarrassing, finally came to check out the scene. The woman who reported the sighting thought that maybe it was an iguana stuck in a tree and might have been in trouble and intensely denied that this creature was a bird. With all of his years investigating situations that sound just like this on the phone, Inspector Adam thought that maybe a neighbor had released a domestic animal that maybe they didn't want it anymore. And we've all seen these cases. In fact, we know these cases on this show. 
people who don't want cats might turf them out into Brazilian islands per our cat episode a few weeks ago, or let fish out into lakes or streams or seas, which causes tons of issues for native populations. Oh, oh, and be careful in the Everglades. All those cute little Burmese pythons at the pet shop? Yeah, they stop being cute at some point and they end up dumped in Florida's marshes. And they do quite well. Some going back to the wild and achieving sizes up to 20 feet long. That's two basketball nets. They wreak havoc on the ecosystem and they can be as wide around as a telephone pole. Small and medium mammals do not stand a chance. So Inspector Adam, with all of his inspectory stuff, went out to check the scene. Just chilling between two branches, Inspector Adam clearly saw the silent, stealthy mystery creature. As he crept closer for a better look, probably with all the eyes of the neighbors peeping through the closed curtains, Inspector Adam noticed this creature did not have legs. Or a tail. Or a head. And smelled... delicious? See, the mystery creature that put fear into the hearts and souls of the people of Krakow, Poland, was nothing more than a now several-day-old croissant... likely tossed from another neighbor to feed the real wildlife in the area, or maybe just taken from a raccoon, and it got stuck in a tree. We're going to talk about the time that the Australian army were rightfully embarrassed and lost a war to flightless birds. The emu is one of Australia's national animals. We in America have the bald eagle, which in the most American manner, does not actually have the loud, powerful, majestic caw that we have all been led to believe. That sound that you hear in media, in podcasts, in cartoons, in television, that sound is a hawk. And it's a trick to make us think that our national bird is a stronger bird than it really is. Hold in your head what you think an eagle sounds like. Hold it. Hold it. Okay, good. Now here is what an eagle soaring overhead sounds like in real life. Doesn't really send the same message as America is all powerful, does it? The emu remaining the national creature of Australia after this story that I'm about to tell you is a great cautionary tale that you cannot always shoot things that make you angry. And that nature will always find a way to win. Yay! The scene. 1932-ish. Campion, Australia. Not the Opera House Australia, not the cool coral reefy part of Australia. The part in the West where it's largely uninhabitable, dust for days, hot and not in the cool way, as in, that's hot, with a W? It's hot, like, we'll kill you kind of way. It's also a couple of years out from the Great Depression, which absolutely is an overarching character in this story. And because it's after World War I, the war to end all wars, that didn't end any wars and laid the very foundation for World War II a few years later, we had millions of wartime heroes without a nickel to their name or a place to call home. So in steps the Australian government who promised housing to these heroes, an uninhabitable part of Western Australia that was supposed to be the wheat belt, an agricultural area to grow and produce wheat, turning these soldiers into farmers. Let them work out in this area, in this marginalized area, this area that is like areas in areas you might know, the areas where people don't really want to see or help or be reminded of a war when we walk out of the front door. These people can just go live. Over there. But the government gets farmers to grow, harvest, and work the land. And the now farmers get to make an honest living. And a place, though, maybe not the best place in the 1920s and 30s. But it's a place to call home. It wasn't much, but it was theirs. But the irony was that by clearing all this land for wheat and bringing in water and crops and supplies for livestock, the government created a situation where these farmers, knee soldiers met face-to-face with a new foe, a formidable foe, a flightless foe. You see, this land wasn't much, but it was theirs, and 20,000 emus. 
So as these emus would breed by the coast and make their way inland to the really uninhabitable places of Australia, there are crops for freshly fertilized eggs these emus were carrying. Water for these tired, thirsty birds who, while they are suited for the outback, like any good Alpha Chi Omega pledge, you are not going to turn down a drink. So like any of us would do on long stretches of highway and you see the rest stop on the right cresting in the distance and the sign that says next stop 100 miles, you take that rest stop. You drink that bad fountain soda, that greasy french fry, and you go pee while you can. So these emus took the rest stop. They ate those crops. They destroyed the fences because how else do you eat crops if they're behind a metal fence? Fly? Ha! That's for normal birds, not these guys. Not these birds who march to their own drum because, well, because they can only march. They can't fly. The holes in these metal fences left whatever crops were left indefensible to other animals that we've discussed on this show before. The feral, feral rabbits who will eat anything in sight. To the point where, in much of Australia, cute little bunny rabbits are illegal to own as they are one of the largest destroyers of an entire ecology on this continent. The ex-military farmers could have met with the Department of Agriculture. I'd argue they should have met with the Department of Agriculture, but why meet with that department? This is a colony of soldiers out of a war at the back end of a depression, and these migratory birds are taking what's theirs. Of course they would go to the only place they knew, the only department in the entire government that they thought would have their backs, the only department they felt heard, listened to, respected, the Department of Defense. And the soldiers, now farmers, were correct. The Department of Defense absolutely 100% had their backs. Though, as you'll see, having someone's back isn't always an indication that mistakes aren't made. It was here that Sir George Pierce, a great name for a Minister of Defense, which he was, heard the pleas, the cries, the despair, the frustration from these soldiers, now farmers. And he also heard their request. Machine guns. Machine guns for flightless birds. Which he gave them. With conditions. Military personnel only would use these machine guns, that these birds would be great target practice after all, and transportation of the soldiers would be funded by the government. However, the soldier farmers would be responsible for feeding the military personnel and for paying for all the ammunition, which was 10,000 machine gun bullets and other rounds for less interesting guns in the outback. And wasn't it just their luck, the bad luck for the military, the soldier farmers, the Department of Defense, that a part of the world, unlike Seattle, Washington, or the region of New York affected greatly by lake effect snow and rain, that this part of the world in Australia does not have the luxury of long spouts of rain. But on this day, the day the generals, the soldiers, the ex-soldiers, now farmers, the brass went to war with emus, it rained scattering the emus over an area that was considered too wide for machine gun fire. According to a newspaper article written on October 18, 1932, the settlers told the authorities in Perth that maybe we should postpone the departure of the machine guns to these birds because of the rain. What if we just wait a day or two? And the Minister of Defense said, sure. It wasn't days. Two weeks later, in November, the military with the farmers turned soldiers ready for action, they rolled out for really reals this time to collect a hundred emu skins. They say it was so their feathers could make hats for the military horsemen to wear, but really, let's be really real, it's because that's what guys with guns looking for trophies do. They kill things and take a piece of it to make a thing of it. The men, because men, rolled out with their machine guns in their cars, <laughs> set up and saw the birds in sight. The farmer soldiers, or soldier farmers, it's hard to tell which part of the men were in control at this point, maybe both, tried to herd the emus into a big group, but these were not bird-brained birds. They split into groups and dispersed, and also stood just out of range of the machine guns. And they were fast. Emus can run up to 30 miles an hour, so they were very hard to hit, especially when they are scattering to the winds in smaller groups. The first round of gunfire was ineffective, but the second managed to kill some birds. How many were killed out of 20,000? 12. 
Two days later, when the men with the brass at the top of the leader chain spotted their enemy, a bunch of birds at a local dam, he demanded an all-out machine gun assault. They got so close that there was no way, not a single way, that these machine guns could miss these thousand or so birds. Until their guns jammed early in their assault. Twelve more emus fell, but the other 988 likely ran, then looked these men up and down. If they could do that thing with the two fingers pointing at their eyes, then the soldiers' eyes, then back to their eyes, they would have done it. This means war. The military does what militaries do. They made a map and a plan. They figured out how to flush the enemy. The enemy, emus, were moving south. But the birds broke into groups, and each group had their own leader, their own general of sorts, their own war hero. Threatened by the sight of these six-foot flightless feathered foes, who seemed to be learning how to run their own animal army, my my how the tables have turned, the military decided to mount a machine gun on a truck in the Australian outback. I'm going to repeat that this move does not end well for the military. The theory was that if the emus, fast on foot reaching speeds of over 30 miles an hour, were to run, the jeep could certainly outpace a freaking bird. Listeners, it could not outpace a freaking bird. The army thought it would be a cakewalk. Just roll up on these birds, drive by, shoot. Hey, their problems would be over. But what the army forgot to consider was the very environment in which they were operating. This is emu territory. This is unforgiving. Bumpy, bumpy, very bumpy land. As the emus ran and the jeep took off at over 30 miles an hour as planned, the gunner, as not planned, could not operate the machine gun as he was too busy trying not to die by being flung out of a jeep driving 30 miles an hour in the Australian desert. The emus, if you're keeping track at home, are now up 3-0. to zero. Yay! By day 6... 2,500 rounds of ammunition or bullets have been fired at the birds. Some say up to 50 birds of 20,000 were killed. The farmer soldiers, wanting a win, wanting to save their fields, their food, their homes, their pride, provided numbers totaling up to 500 birds. Either way, the army noted, as they should, that there were zero military casualties in this war. None of their men had died, so they must be winning. I guess you take your wins where you can get them. Though one emu was sadly hit by a truck after one of these machine gun on car attacks. The truck killed the poor bird, but an autopsy of the emu revealed that the bird was already shot five times and was still able to run. Leading to my favorite quote from the Sun-Herald, quote, If we had a military division with the bullet-carrying capacity of these birds, it would face any army in the world. They can face machine guns with the invulnerability of tanks. According to Australian ornithologist Dominic Cervanti, the machine gunner's dreams of point-blank fire into the serried masses of emus were soon dissipated. The emu command had evidently ordered guerrilla tactics, and its unwielding army soon split up into innumerable small units that made use of military equipment uneconomic. A crestfallen field force therefore withdrew from combat after a month. After about six days of gunfire, Pierce withdrew the guns, retreated, and regrouped. After the military withdrew, the emus doubled down on their own attacks. You know, food. Keep in mind that November, while it's getting chilly and crisp here in the northern hemisphere, it's hot, hot, hot in the southern Due to a drought, the emus doubled down on their assault on food crops, irrigation, and water on farms. The base commander for the Australian army reported 300 emus died in the first assault. You know, I guess he was splitting the difference between that 50 and 500. So the Department of Defense went back to the Australian Senate, defending the use of machine guns against flightless native birds doing what flightless native birds do, eat food and drink water. No one apparently suggested, um, have you tried a higher fence? Or, is this really what our military should be focused on? Or, I don't know, talking to any animal experts. 
but by going to the Australian Senate explaining why the soldiers were necessary to combat the serious agricultural threat of emus. The plea of, but the birds are smarter than we are and we have guns. They were given a second shot. Go get them, boys. So the same people were put in charge, the same guns were put on the field, and the same fields were defended. Y'all, this does not go well for the military. Out of 20,000 emus, the National Bird of Australia, around 986 were ultimately killed over a five-week period. Some reports from the military suggested over 2,500 died of their wounds, but that's a bad look. Injuring the national bird to the point that if it dies painfully days or weeks later, you're calling it a win? And there was no real proof, just what the military said. Because let's face it, it looks really bad. If your army, the arm of government that is theoretically supposed to protect the nation, or let's be real, certain parts of the nation, and are supposed to do target practice drills, you know, one shot, one kill kind of thing. And that same army needs 9,886 bullets from a machine gun to kill only 900 birds. 900 of your national bird. 10 bullets, give or take, per bird to take one emu down? Can you imagine America saying, no, no, go on, kill as many bald eagles as you can. Take... 10 bullets for each eagle and bring me their feathers. The military in Australia was spinning this as a win. Listener, this was not a win. England, however, because it was 1932 and things were, you know, busy, there was no Twitter, no Insta things, no way for news like this to spread like a virus or a meme. In fact, there were no memes. They finally heard about this war with the emus in December of 1932, about a month after the rain delay and troops were deployed with machine guns to start losing a war with birds. The parliament, in response to the military saying, um, but, but each group of birds has a leader, a six foot black plumed bird, and it keeps watch. Because yeah, you have machine guns and you can't handle a bird watching you. Parliament rightfully said, quote, any medals from this war should go to the emus who has won every round so far. Yay! Of which I hope there are little emu purple hearts and medals of honor passed down from grandfather emu to green egged emus because fact, they do have green eggs. But also the image is just really cute. Grandfather, tell us about the time you outwitted the Australian army. Well, kiddo, in my day, there was a drought. Machine guns everywhere, and all we had were our legs and a few taller emus that just looked at the military with a squint. That's all it took, kid. Our eyes. Today, the military stands by the fact that this war, this great battle over the wheat, the wheat that was planted in areas that were cleared for discarded military to live, to be farmers, to be hidden, to be out of the way, but still give back to the country, netted zero military fatalities. While the media, and let's face it, people like me and internet culture, look at it differently. How many people died of the famine, of the drought that brought the emus to the farms to begin with? Of the depression of the wars that these men who theoretically practice on the emus as target practice and were humbled by that target practice as these targets moved fast and fought back. Even if it was dumb luck or blind panic, as some suggest, or plotting superior minds, as I giggle to imagine. How many people died of those other things? It was way more than 986. Emu wars and things like it take our eyes off the bigger picture. So let's look at the emu wars, like the Newfoundlands rescuing 180 people who turned out to be Irish immigrants. Like goats drinking pee, like a border collie getting $5 million in inheritance. And all of the other topics that we cover in this show and others. And keep digging, keep asking why. Because as we find out here as I keep not expecting the sharp left turn from the humor, 
there is almost always something horrible or hilarious, sometimes both, and we just get to find out together. And I'm really glad you're here with me as I go on this journey. I'm not alone. Thank you. So what happened to the emus and the farmers? The soldiers turned farmers turned emu mercenaries turned farmers again, asked for military intervention time and time and time again in 1934, in 1943, and 1948, only to be, and you'll be shocked, shocked to hear that they were turned down by the government. But after these events and the mockery in Parliament, agricultural management was finally put in place, including rationed bullets for farmers want soldiers to handle their own property, but only for the use of protecting the wheat. And exclusion barrier fencing was used almost exclusively to keep out wildlife like the emus out of agricultural areas, which worked out really, really, really well. This fencing also magically works against other non-flying creatures like dingoes and rabbits and kangaroo and cane toads and armed military. The pyromaniac birds, however, who set fire to everything to get food, though, from back in episode 7? Yeah, there's no barrier fencing for them, so good luck with that. Buckle in, y'all. Here's my favorite line in this HuffPo article from 2017. Despite the terrifying nature of Australian wildlife, and here it comes. We haven't used this in a while. Common phobia warning. Common phobia warning. Spiders. Y'all, it was only a matter of time. We're on episode 35. And I have spoken many times on this show how I have a genuine phobia of spiders. And even saying the word makes it makes my heart beat faster. My voice go up an octave. I breathe shallower and faster and I talk faster and I get hot in the face. And, and I'm in a tiny dark closet when I record these. So I'm just going to go as fast as I can before my mind makes this utterly impossible. Whew. Okay. I want to love spiders. I get that they eat bugs and they protect our plants and... and Our ecosystems are dependent on these guys. My brain gets it. But part of my brain bypasses logic at the very thought, which is honestly what a phobia is. How a person without a phobia sees a spider, a snake, or something that might resemble or move like or be interpreted by the brain as something in the same group or category as the phobia is they see the thing. So let's say it's a spider. Okay, so the spider image goes into the eyeballs. It's processed in the part of the brain called the thalamus. And the thalamus sends a quick email to the occipital lobe. And that's the part of your brain that processes sight with an image of the spider. So in a brain without spider phobia, the occipital lobe slowly opens the attachment, sees the picture and says, oh, good picture there, mate. Enjoy your day and moves on to the next email. Side note. Did you know that the part of your brain that processes sight is at the very back of your brain? But, and here's how a phobia works, the thalamus sends some of that info, like a copy of an email, to both the occipital lobe, which can take an extra second or two to process what it's reading and move along, but the thalamus also copies the email with the spider attachment to the amygdala, And the amygdala is like the alarm bell, a fire alarm, the guy who panics at every little thing. The amygdala can send a message to fight, flight, or freeze when you are scared. But the amygdala just gets part of the message really fast. I guess it's operating on the best Apple computer while the occipital lobe is running on like an old Commodore. The amygdala sees just a portion of the image and then just utterly panics. This might have saved our ancestors millions of years ago. These spiders, trees, heights, tight spaces, and other very common phobias are rooted in our emotional brains. The amygdala. Falling out of trees can kill you. Big spiders can kill you. The nope rope can give you a hug and that's lights out, etc. Most phobias make sense in how humans evolved. And for many people, these phobias linger. And the amygdala was born ready to handle whatever comes our way, like it or not, rational or not. In fact, a phobia is considered an extreme or irrational fear or an aversion of something. 
So back to how my phobia works and how if you have one, it works for you too. So image comes into the thalamus, thalamus cc's the occipital lobe and the amygdala. Amygdala gets the message first and sounds the alarm bell before the brain has even processed what it is that you see. If you have a phobia, you jump before you even realize that you had seen a spider. Which is why the very word sp- oh, spider starts to make my body go into tense adrenaline town. And why if you're afraid of snakes and you see a rope blow by in the wind, your body goes into hyperdrive. Or for me, any smaller scurrying thing with more than six legs will make me go karate on whoever comes near. Sorry to my friend Bonnie, who thought she was being funny and crawled her fingers up my spine in a psychology class on how phobias work. I instead screamed in her ear and tossed a table and ran across the room. (laughs) Demonstrating for an entire class what a real phobia was. Sorry, Dr. Yushannon. And it was something I know, and I love spiders with 98% of my brain. I cry at the end of Charlotte's Web as a kid and as an adult. But it's the 2% of my brain, the alarmy part of my brain, that doesn't. And that 2% is a mighty, mighty, loud, obnoxious 2%. So keep that in mind and think about the convulsions and the panic I'm talking myself out of. And I'm working really hard not to freak out as I tell you a story about the Australian zoo. Because, of course, Australia is begging the public, you know, normal folks like you, like me, to catch deadly spiders for milking. Yes, milking. Like a cow. I mean, not really like a cow, but... Okay, so... If you hear a thud, just I'll edit it out. It's fine. We're fine. So fine. Okay, so there's this spider called the funnel webbed spider. And I'm not looking it up. I don't know if their webs are delicious like funnel cakes or if they make a funnel shaped web. You can image search it if you like. And I encourage you to just do not report back. I can't. Anyway, these deadly spiders due to heat waves in Australia are more active and they're biting more people. That's bad. The large fangs and the acidic venom make this bite incredibly painful to the victim, and it can kill a human in one hour after a bite. So that's all bad, 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 bad. Don't like that. Okay, so however, in 1981, hey, my birth year represent, the Australian Reptile Park produced an antidote to this venom. It needs other funnel spiders to do it. And this place, Reptile Park, remains the only supplier in Australia to produce this anti-venom. But it relies on the public to see these spiders catch them in their house, meaning these spiders are in people's houses. Australia? The Sydney Opera House, I hear it's beautiful, but this might be a bridge too far. So the spiders have to be caught by the public so the spiders can be milked for venom, the poison that kills you, to make an antidote, the medicine that saves you. Science, y'all, is wild. So my least favorite line in that same HuffPo article, quote, with an appropriate jar and a wooden spoon, you can flick the spider into the jar so easily. And while it's my least favorite line, catching these spiders can save someone's life. 98% of my brain knows that. And if I were to cater to the angry, loud, irrational, reactionary 2% of my brain that can't hear rational thinking, (coughs) literally cannot hear it, its only purpose is to respond and react quickly and emotionally and loudly and forcefully without hearing all the facts, then I would not be able to end this story with this. My favorite line in the HuffPost article, despite the terrifying reputation of the Australian wildlife, Nobody has died from this bite of a funnel web spider since the anti-venom program began in 1981. We've been doing this for 35 years, and no one has gotten hurt. All right, Australia. You're all right. You're still trying to kill me, but you're all right. Keep up the good work. So, thanks for joining me today on Bewilderbeasts. 
If you like this podcast, share and tell all your friends. It is truly the best way to support the show. And if you want to hear a foul mouth version of this, check out my other podcast with my friend, Dr. Sipperstein, totallypossumpod.com. If there are topics you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or other foodstuffs that have been confused for animals in the news, there are multiple ways to send them in or let me know what you think of the show. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod. I'm pretty active over there, so come check me out on Twitter. DM or voice text on bewilderbeastpod on Facebook. Or lurk at bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McKee McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information from... I got today's information regarding the mysterious tree creature from delish.com, history.com, delish.com on animal control croissants, and history.com on the Burmese python invasion in Florida. Army versus emu from smithsonianmag.com, todayifoundout.com, which is a really fun website. You should check it out. blogs.scientificamerican.com, Atlas Obscura, my favorite website on the internet, LA Times, and Wikipedia, because of course. And the got milk story from HuffPost.com and Wikipedia on the amygdala hijack. So if you have a phobia, that's a really great resource for you. Links are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the stuff every other podcast tells you to do. Thanks for listening. Send me non-spidery things, and I will see you next week. Bye.